For most, Chernobyl was a nuclear accident in Eastern Europe. But Chernobyl is a much darker story filled with mistakes, cover-ups, and sacrifice. What exactly went wrong at Chernobyl? Keep watching to find out. At 1.23 a.m. on April 26, 1986, there was a loud bang inside the Chernobyl nuclear power plant near Pripyat, the USSR. The six men who were conducting a safety test were confused and unaware of the extent of the damage. The ignorance was based on a piece of information that the Soviet Russian government had published. An RBMK-type nuclear reactor can't explode. This was untrue, and it was just one of the many actions that the government took to cover mistakes they had made when building the nuclear power plant and after the disaster. On April 25th, 1986, the Chernobyl crew was supposed to conduct a safety test meant to check if its emergency systems would function under inertial force in the case of a power outage. Anatoly Dyatlov, the deputy chief engineer, and Viktor Bryukhanov, the plant manager, had tried to conduct three such safety tests in the past and had failed each time. The safety test procedure required that the power of the reactor be reduced from 3,200 megawatts to 700 to simulate a blackout condition. Dyatlov reduced Reactor 4's power to 1,600 megawatts on April 25th, preparing for the test. But orders from above came that the lowering of the power had to be postponed for 10 hours. Certain quotas had to be met and reported to the Central Committee in Moscow. It's the end of the month. All the productivity quotas, everyone's working overtime, the factories need power, someone's pushing down from above. This wasn't the first time that safety had been disregarded in favor of expediency. It was often that the Soviet Union awarded people for reaching a goal by the end of the month or year. Bryukhanov was awarded Hero of Socialist Labor for completing the construction of Reactor 4 before the end of 1983. The International Atomic Energy Agency concluded that the Chernobyl project went against safety culture in everything – design, construction, equipment, administration, and operation. Even though there was some concerns about this postponement, Dyatlov and Bryukhanov pushed to conduct the safety test that night. Rumors of promotion had them motivated to complete the test as soon as possible. Completing the safety test after midnight posed not just a stability problem, it also meant that the night shift, a group of people completely unprepared for the test, was now responsible for conducting it. Alexander Akimov was the shift chief that night. He started the test under Dyatlov's supervision and noticed that the power was plummeting uncontrollably, down to a dangerous 30 megawatts. Because it had been working at lower power for almost 12 hours, Reactor 4 was poisoned by a xenon buildup. Akimov refused to carry out the test, but Dyatlov threatened to fire him and make sure he would never work again. This was a common threat among Soviet officials. We are told very strictly not to tell the population that anything is wrong. Our job was to tell them that everything is good. And if we say opposite, then we will lose our jobs and we would never get them back. Desperate to get the power back up, the men pulled out almost all of the control rods, leaving just eight, when safety protocols called for a minimum of 15. With the power up but still at an unstable 200 megawatts, Akimov was coerced into running the test. As they switched on the pumps, the cooling water started boiling and turned into steam inside the reactor, causing the power to surge uncontrollably. Dyatlov even ignored an emergency report generated by the reactor's computer system urging to shut down the reactor. It was Akimov that declared an emergency and pressed the AZ-5 or shutdown button. But there was something that no one at Chernobyl knew. There was a fatal flaw with the AZ-5 button in all Soviet nuclear reactors. The control rods, supposed to move back into the reactor and stop the process, had graphite in their composition. This was a cost-cutting decision, made countrywide during production. Because the rod's tips were made of graphite, the moment they entered the reactor, they caused the reaction to skyrocket instead of stopping it. All water converted into steam, blocking the rods in this disastrous position. 
graphite was endlessly accelerating the reaction. At 1.23 a.m., the final reading showed the power of the reactor, designed to operate at 3,200 megawatts, was now 33,000. The AZ button, designed to stop the reaction, produced one big enough to blow up an RBMK reactor. But no one at Chernobyl knew this. This flaw had been edited out of the scientific publication. The KGB and Central Committee made sure this mistake would make the Soviet Union look weak. In fact, most cover-ups that followed the disaster were the Central Committee's efforts to preserve the image of a strong government in front of its people and in front of the world. That's right, the aftermath of Reactor 4's explosion was more lies, lies with a great human cost. When the reactor's lid was blown open, oxygen came out interacting with hydrogen and hot graphite, the radioactivity at a level far above anyone could withstand. But the Chernobyl crew wasn't aware of what had truly happened. When the first crew member came into the control room and reported that the core no longer existed, Dyatlov accused him of being delusional. It exploded. We know we get the backup pumps running, we need water moving through the core, that is all that matters. There is no core. It exploded. The core exploded. He's in shock. Get him out of here. Dyatlov was convinced that the RM key reactors can't explode. Akimov didn't believe it at first either. They informed their superiors of a minor manageable accident. The reader showed the level of radiation at 3.6 retigens per hour. Not great, not terrible. But this was as high as the reader went. This benign number was passed down all the way to President Gorbachev. Even though scientists suggested evacuating the city of Pripet, the Central Committee decided to avoid panic by keeping people misinformed and unaware of the gravity of the accident. It wasn't until the committee elected scientist Valery Legasov as chief of investigation that the real number came out. When Legasov was sent to Chernobyl, Bryukhanov and other officials mocked him for thinking their reactor had exploded. Their denial of scientific facts reminds of George Orwell's 2 plus 2 equals 5 scene in 1984. But a proper reading of 15,000 retigen convinced the officials to take things seriously. Boris Sherbina, who held a high position with the Moscow committee, was sent along with Legasov to manage the disaster. Their mission was to stop the explosion while saving as many people as possible. But this was impossible, as a large firefighter division had already been sent to stop the fire without proper protection. All of these men would die in tremendous pain within two weeks. Ionizing radiation tears the cellular structure apart. The skin blisters, turns red, then black. The patient appears to be recovering for a day or two. Then the cellular damage begins to manifest. The bone marrow dies, the immune system fails, the organs and soft tissues begin to decompose. The arteries and veins spill open like sieves to the point where you can't even administer morphine for the pain, which is unimaginable. This cruel fate could be expected by many of the men who had entered Chernobyl. Divers sent to drain the bubbler tanks to prevent an even greater explosion. Liquidators sent to remove the radioactive graphite from the reactor's roof. About 750,000 men were required for the three-year-long cleanup. Many of them died of cancer. But it's hard to gauge the exact number of deaths caused by Chernobyl. Legasov ordered helicopters to throw boron and sand on the fire, which couldn't be stopped by firefighters alone. Some helicopters disintegrated while flying above the radioactive fire. Then he suggested using moon rovers to remove the dangerous graphite from the roof. Russian rovers melted as soon as they reached the roof. The Soviet Union asked Germany for their strongest rover. However, they still refused to give the actual retigen number, so the German rover was also useless. The official position of the state is that a global nuclear catastrophe is not possible in the Soviet Union. They told the Germans that the highest detected level of radiation was 2,000 Rontgen. Gave them the propaganda number. They had lost valuable time. Legasov knew that more men had to risk their lives cleaning out the graphite while no robot could withstand the radiation. 36 hours after the explosion, Prypiet was finally evacuated. Residents were told to pack fast for a few days. They would never be allowed back in. 
Thousands of pets were abandoned and later killed by soldiers in order to eliminate any threats to spreading the radiation. Living bodies exposed to radiation are not actually contagious to others. This false beliefs had a very dangerous outcome. Many children were evacuated to Moscow and many families in Moscow who were offered to host these children, they rejected because uh, they claim that these children are contaminated. Legasov and his team of scientists believe the plant's melted uranium would sink into the Black Sea, devastating a whole ecosystem. They had miners brought in to dig under the plant and install a cooling source. The miners were brought in against their will, and it turns out their mission was not necessary. The uranium never melted through the concrete ground of the plant. About 100 men died before the age of 40. The botched cleanup mission affected thousands of people, directly by sending men to the site or indirectly through misinformation and withholding the true level of radiation. In July 1987, there was a trial meant to cast light on those responsible for the disaster. Legasov gave a clear account of the errors that had occurred, but his effort to discuss the Soviet Union's cover-up schemes were erased from public records. Legasov became increasingly bitter about the Russian government's lack of initiative towards addressing the flaws in the reactors. Several of their faulty reactors were up and running across the Soviet Union, posing a major threat to the entire world. Legasov hanged himself in his Moscow apartment, two years and one day after the Chernobyl disaster. However, he left five tapes behind. Tapes about haphazard decisions and lies, from the plant crew to the KGB. His legacy would lie in these tapes which, after his led to the RBMK reactor control rods being replaced and, later, to the power plants being shut down. The Soviet government didn't keep any official records of sickness and death caused by Chernobyl. The exclusion zone, or contaminated zone, was 2,600 square kilometers. Radiation spread to most of Europe. Although there was a surge in cancer rates across Ukraine and Belarus, especially in children, these weren't officially linked to the disaster. The actual human cost of Chernobyl remains a mystery. What do you think was the biggest mistake made at Chernobyl? How could such a disaster have been avoided? Let us know what you think in the comments, and while you're at it, click the like and subscribe buttons.